Hi, today we're going to study about biomaterials uh, in biomedical engineering. So we want to understand the definition and types of biomaterial and the concept of biocompatibility and in historical uh, context. For, and also we will discuss about biological responses to external biomaterials. So first, uh, the, there's an artistic uh, form of biomaterials uh, like this uh, figure. So this is uh, uh, an artistic illustration. Uh, however, um, so you see the heart and the lungs and kidneys and liver and stomach. Uh, this is not really uh, true, uh, but just showing uh, uh, the future direction. So the search for artificial replacements for failing our human organs. Um, so we are searching for these artificial organs which can replace uh, our uh, organ. There are some success stories. For example, hemodialysis for replacing kidney function. But think about the hemodialysis machine, which cannot be this small, but it's actually a big equipment and uh, the patient has to go to the clinic and uh, a couple of times a week uh, so that to, to, to filter out uh, his or her uh, blood, replacing uh, the kidney function. So that's uh, not very convenient yet, which means we still do not have the, this artificial kidney. And artificial hip prosthesis. So now we have artificial hip, and also for people who have a problem in the eye uh, or lens, there are artificial lenses for cataract patients. Cataract is the, the symptom that the lens become opaque so that the patient cannot see. Uh, my parents also have this cataract surgery, which is one of the most common surgeries uh, in our country. However, these are a good success stories, but uh, are limited. You can see these are a relatively simple aspect of biomaterial. But the point is there are no proven artificial heart, artificial liver, or artificial pancreas. So which poses a great challenge at the same time an opportunity for biomedical engineers like us to develop these more sophisticated uh, organs which potentially can benefit uh, many, many people who have uh, problems in their organ function. So let's uh, first uh, see what is biomaterials. A, uh, there are some historic definitions I want to uh, introduce. A non-viable uh, material used in a medical device, which is intended to interact with our biological systems. Another way of looking at it is synthetic or natural materials that are used in contact with biological systems. So for the biomaterial, there, there are requirements for biomaterial because that is in contact with our biological system. So it has to be non-harmful to the living body in which they are placed. So that we call as whether it's compatible or not. So that's called biocompatibility. So frequently, biomaterials are polymers or metals. So polymers are more like soft aspects of replacement and hard aspects such as bone, uh, there are metal. So biocompatibility is the ability of a material to perform with an appropriate host response in a specific application. Host response means our body's natural uh, response. For example, like immune system uh, against some, uh, some foreign body, foreign material, uh, which is coming into our body. And biocompatibility is the ability to be in contact with a living system without producing an adverse effect. So I want to discuss about some history. So there are uh, pretty good uh, uh, review, his, his historical highlights, which is related to biomaterial, especially bionics and related medicine. You can see it starts from even 
uh, like over 500 years ago until today. So let me go through a little bit of these histories. So for about 500 years ago, uh, there were iron prosthetic hands. So for those who, who lost hands with a flexible finger joints uh, was found. And about 200 years ago, development of endoscope uh, for minimally invasive surgery. We developed an endoscopy. And about more than 75 years ago, uh, introduction of silver amalgam for dental fillings. In 1888, first report of contact lens to correct vision. In 1905, an um, early attempt of an artificial hip replacement for those who have a problem in the hip joint. And only after quite recent, about 1949, the role of immune system uh, in tissue rejection is identified. What do we mean by tissue rejection? If there's an artificial biomaterial getting into the tissue, then our immune system will sometimes reject. Or when we do a transplantation of an organ from other, uh, other uh, person to a host, then the host system will recognize it as a foreign and try to reject that organ. That is a, a big problem still in uh, organ transplantation. In 1951, the first artificial heart valve was implanted. This is a big story that because uh, this heart valve issue is a very, uh, it can be very fatal. So 1953, now developing heart lung machine for when there needs a heart, whole heart transplantation, during the time we need to replace the heart and the lung function. So we did need a heart lung machine. In 1980, the first successful single channel cochlear implant was uh, used in a child. So cochlear implant is artificial, um, artificial ear replacement. Uh, but there's, it, this is only single channel. Nowadays, we have like eight channel or 24 channels available. 1982, the implantation of a permanent total artificial heart was implanted. Of course, it wasn't very successful at the beginning. Uh, I think still the total artificial heart cannot be like permanent. 1993, FDA, US FDA approved the first left ventricular assist device, uh, which is used as a bridge to total heart transplantation. So what is the, the last thing, uh, ventricular assist device? Uh, that uh, I have this picture, which shows that you can see this left ventricle. So the left ventricle function is not good enough, then, uh, the function of left ventricle is a pump. So we put the pump here to the left ventricle and then pump up goes to the aorta. So this requires a power and ener energy so that there's an electrical wire connected to external battery. So VAD or left ventricle assist device is not an artificial heart. Uh, because artificial heart designed to assume the whole cardiac function. And also uh, it requires removing patient heart and then put this artificial heart. But this one is really supporting and assisting. So that's why ventricular assisted device. However, think about this device uh, when you are waiting for total heart uh, transplantation. So what kind of complication can happen? So first of all, this big biological material inside our body, then our immune system will try to reject this. So we may need an immunosuppression drug so that we drop down our natural immune activities so that this device can be uh, not rejected. Because of this, there's a lot more risk of infection for the patient. You can also think this, uh, this part of the electrical wire passing through the skin. So there's a higher risk of infection as well. And another, so now we are directly touching this device with the, our blood system. So blood 
which is normally flowing uh, on, uh, on endothelial layer. Now this is different. So there's higher risk of clotting. So these clots can form and then shed to our brain that will cause uh, more uh, frequent stroke aspects. And because of this, uh, the patient may need anticoagulant treatment, which means uh, to reducing the blood clotting. And that actually uh, leads to coagulopathy and uh, more of a bleeding risk. So there's a, a number of these lists of side effects and complications. So those who the patient need to be well informed about uh, what this uh, before uh, this uh, VAD uh, uh, surgery. So here, a uh, little more of explanation. The devices are generally result in blood flowing over non-biologic surface. It predisposes the blood to clot. And so there's a need for anticoagulation. And for example, one device is to, uh, to resolve this problem. It designed a biological surface, surface uh, from fibrin, fibrin coating. So it does do not require long-term anti-coagulation treatment, uh, but still the patient need an aspirin, which does have some anti-coagulation uh, function. Unfortunately, this biological surface may also predispose the patient to infection because this turned out to be uh, reducing certain kind of leukocyte or white blood cell is, uh, is uh, uh, reduced. That means our an, uh, function against the infection is uh, a lower. So now let's get into a little bit of a history of biological materials. So very long time ago, you can see um, surgical suture uh, to repair wound sites is probably the first very old uh, biomaterials. And the second polymethyl methyl acrylate or we call it as a PMMA, uh, which is acryl or acrylic glass or uh, more famously uh, known as its uh, brand name called plexiglass. So this has been used for dental bases, artificial teeth, surgical uh, splinting, and hip prosthesis, which is also a very long time ago. Another biomaterial that I want to discuss is a uh, catheter, which is writ written as a catheter, uh, a thin hollow tube formed uh, out of a polymer, which serves uh, as a, a sometimes very important function. So for example, in history, Fritz uh, Bleicherroder, uh, who first performed a catheterization with his own femoral artery, more than 100 years ago. So femoral artery is in, on your big thigh, black, so this has a, a big artery, so we can insert this catheter to here, uh, which go back to the heart. And in history, there's another one, <clears throat> Werner Vogtmann, <clears throat> the story, who is a, was a pioneer because he first demonstrated cardiac catheterization, meaning that we can put catheter or hollow tubes through our own uh, vessel or vascular conduit reaching to the heart, inside the heart. He demonstrated in 1929. And the story is fascinating. So I put here uh, the link of this in uh, online library. So you can read it. Uh, basically, he was a very young, um, resident doctor um, who, who was thinking that maybe catheter could be directly in, uh, inserted into the heart. Of course, at that time, that was regarded as a fatal, but he, he wanted to prove his idea, uh, but his chief rejected the idea, and uh, he ends up with by persuading uh, a nurse that uh, the nurse agreed only if he can do this into the nurse, not him. But he tricked the nurse by asking her to do while like cutting her the nurses. But in fact, he actually put the catheter. This is a urethral catheter, so it's a narrow 
to not the nurse but his own um, <coughs> vein in his arm. So it after that he bring this with the nurse to went into the X-ray room and insert more up to sixty centimeter and he observed that the tip of the catheter in fact ends up in the right atrium of his heart. So with his X-ray imaging, you know this is a famous story that. It led to a Nobel Prize in 1956. However, in his own story, that um, he did this one to himself uh, instead of uh, doing this um, uh, animal study, which came later on. Um, unfortunately, however, he didn't pass his uh, PhD uh, exam that. Uh, he had a trouble in his career, but later on, after he got Nobel Prize, uh, he become he worked as a urologist. But this is a, a kind of how in history a discovery has been made, and because this led to a very important uh, modern cardiac catheterization lab, or simply we call it as a cath lab, and this is a, a you know a major hospital has an examination room. Uh, with a diagnostic imaging device, uh, equipment, usually a real-time x-ray, to visualize the arteries of the heart. Uh, that visualization is done by an, a contrast agent inserting into the bloodstream that uh, during the short time of distribution, one can actually see the narrowing of the, uh, or stenosis of the, the carotid artery and chambers of the heart. So this is a, a, an example figure, a photo of cardiac cath lab. You can see a patient here, and this is real-time x-ray, and you can see these uh, uh, pictures to show the diagnosis and during the treatment procedure. And I uh, happen to have a cardiology friend's uh, cardiologist. So I visited there, and there was a, a patient who happened to have a right a blood clot just uh, uh, blocking her um, uh, coronary artery. So it was an emergency. So there we have to wear um, an apron with a lead because there are x-rays coming. So we are at the risk of exposing uh, this x-ray radiation. So he inserted this catheter onto this uh, femoral artery uh, uh, area with a shift, and that catheter uh, goes through this aorta, then it goes to the left atrium, uh, uh, not necessarily left atrium, it goes to eventually to that blocked uh, vessel, coronary artery, and he inserted a tool to grab that blood clot and then suck it and then take it out so, so that otherwise the patient could have died. So this happens a lot, and um, this cardiac cath lab serves as a very important tool for diagnosis for people who have a heart problem. So with this, um, next time we will discuss about biological response to biomaterials, especially coagulation cascade and response to biomaterials in contact with the blood. Thank you for your attention.